Welcome to the second part of this course. Uh, up until now, you have been talking about networks. Now we'll we move forward to uh, servers and hardware. Uh, let's get the clicker going. I've been thinking about how to interact with you as students, both in the classroom and uh, on the internet. Uh, and it's quite hard uh, for the students who are not here in the classroom. Uh, in this course, we only have two students here in the classroom. Uh, so I good, get good feedback from them. But from you as a distance students, it's quite hard to know, did you understand the topic uh, I was uh, talking about? Uh, if I have questions, I, I, I can ask them. But it's hard to get some feedback back. So I have tried. Um, we will try to have a system for this today. Uh, the students who are attending this course or this program are used to it. It's called Pingo. Uh, and we use that for multiple choice uh, questions that I have. Uh, so you will get a link when we have a question. We will try that out in a, just a couple of minutes. Um, and then you get, I, you, you should have your mobile phone or another tab in your uh, web browser with this open. You don't uh, exit it, uh, that window when uh, that question is done because we will reuse that for the next question. And this is for all uh, who are attending uh, via uh, Live Coding TV. Uh, so uh, please follow this and I will get some feedback back from you. Uh, if I have questions that are more of a text response from you students, I, uh, you can uh, write in the Live Coding TV chat or via Slack, uh, but that's only for our students who are uh, registered for the course. And I will look at that. So we'll start with one <coughs> question. Uh, so you see down here you have a QR code if your mobile phone uses that. Or you can enter this URL and then open that in another browser uh, and have that open during this. Um, you will soon get th this question also in that window and you will have two minutes I think to answer this question. Okay, so we have some results and I have a guy who's helping me with this who's running the technique in the room and Sue you will have a graph of the answers that you supplied. Uh, soon enough. <laughs> uh, as you know, th this is quite hard to answer this question, what is the server? Uh, and I see that in the graphs too, that uh, I should have said that it's multiple choice, so you could have answered a lot of these uh, options. Uh, but I think some people just uh, we have a 100 response on the B, this option. That won't show. So everyone see, seems to think that that is a uh, correct one. Uh, we will see if we get a graph, or we will just skip that. I can tell you what. The graph is there, right? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't see the graph. <laughs> uh, so as you see, we have. Uh, people have uh, actually put in on all of the options. I would say uh, that A through D is correct. An applica uh, service application working in the background, you can't say that that is a server actually because it, it can be a server, but we have very many services running on every computer who's, that are not uh, acting as a ser server. Uh, so why did I bring this question. Well, that's because of our topic today. Uh, and that is a uh, server from hardware to software. So we will go through uh, from layer one in the OSI model uh, hardware, what differentiate a computer into a server. Or can we say that every computer is a server? And then we'll go through an operating system. We have server operating systems. And what is the difference between a desktop operating system and a server operating system? And the last part will be about software. 
what will make a software into a server and what will not. So we will try this again and now you will soon see uh, some hardware, some computers um, and you will have four options and I, the question is which one is a server? A, B, C and D. Soon enough. <laughs> Point again. Point again, okay. Here we have A, option A, option B, option C, option D. Which one is the server? Uh, I think we will manage for one minute here for the question. I will not answer this one yet. We will uh, come back to this question uh, after we have discussed uh, what makes up the server. And then we can go through uh, which option was the correct one. Uh, so the basic uh, components of a computer. This is not specific to a an, an server. We'll have to start with what makes up a computer before we can go into what difference that into a server. So these are the basic components. If you search the web or looking books for the basic compo components of computer, you will get a lot of different answers. But these are the ones that I think is the, the basic ones. Uh, so the input unit uh, is responsible for reading or accepting some sort of instruction or data. Uh, that could be a keyboard or a mouse or even a network card. Uh, that will then convert this input or this instructions or data into some sort of format that the computer can or a processor can uh, process. Uh, the, because it maybe gets an input about uh, X coordinates from the mouse or Y coordinates and the computer doesn't understand that. It has to uh, convert that into some binary code. Uh, and then it will supply these converted instructions into the next uh, step, which is the, the storage unit. Uh, when you hear the term storage, you may be thinking about, well, hardware, some sort of hard disk or something like that. Uh, but this is usually a reference to as the primary or main storage, main memory. And it's a really fast uh, memory. Uh, that receives these instructions from the input devices. Uh, and there it is stored until the, the CPU or the control unit has time to process it. Uh, and it immediates these results uh, between processing because you have, sometimes you have to process data multiple times before it's done. Uh, but we will get to that in the next part. Um, when it's done, it will also store the results that it gets from the, from the CPU uh, until the output unit is ready to receive it. So the Central processing unit, or the CPU, as we usually say, uh, is responsible for the events inside the computer. Here, this is the, the brain, you can say, uh, of the computer. Uh, it controls all internal and external devices that are connected to the computer. And it has two major components. Uh, you have the ALU, the arithmetic and logical unit, uh, which is the, the, the part, or the component that act, does the actual uh, calculation uh, of the, the data. Uh, it will also immediate the results back to the primary storage. Uh, it can do this a lot of times before it's considered done. And how do we know when it's done? Uh, well, we have the control unit who answers all these questions about how does the input to device know when it's supposed to read data or transfer it to the, the storage unit. Uh, so, so the control unit is the, the, the brain that makes the decisions of, on what should, what should be done with the data. So when it's been processed, uh, it goes to an uh, output unit, and the output unit is like a reverse of the input unit. It accepts data 
uh, from the computer and it is coded, you can say. It's not readable for us humans, it's binary code uh, usually. So it converts it back to something that it, we humans can understand. The output unit could be a, a graphics card or something like that. Uh, and then it will uh, supply the results to the outside world. Uh, it could be an, an, a network device also, a, a network card in this uh, context. So, what makes a computer into a server? Well, basically the, the main point is that it's supposed to be run all the time. That is the big uh, thing that differentiates a, a, a computer, that's a computer from a server. And to be able to do that, it has to have re re <coughs> reliable hardware. Uh, usually it also have redundant hardware, so you can have some part of it break and still it will go on. Uh, and the feature of hot swap which is uh, that you can change part during its uptime. So you don't have to put down, uh, you have to, don't have to power off the server before you change the parts. Usually you also have some sort of monitoring uh, hardware, so the server can be monitored, uh, and you have management features. So we can now go and back to the question actually um, of what makes these as a server. Uh, I didn't see the result actually of the question. <laughs> uh, which one was? Hardware. Hmm? And that I think it's, yes, this is a server. And B, Johan? Uh, 40%. 40%, yes. Uh, this is a desktop computer. Uh, but I can understand why you say it can be a server, because it can depend on if I talk about a software. Well, you can run a server on this, but the hardware is not a server. This is not designed to be run 24-7. How about C? 70. 70%. This is also a server. Uh, it looks quite different. We will look into them in a, in a minute. And D? I think it's 40%. 40%. This is also a server. It's a blade server. Uh, and it's you have to have another unit actually to run it because it doesn't have a power supply, it doesn't have network in this unit. So you will get this and put it into a bigger chassis. But we will look at that. So if I could get my cameraman <laughs> and the students in the classroom, we can look at some parts of these uh, and see how these differentiate uh, from a normal computer. Uh, You want for Seattle. Uh, so this is a rack server. Uh, in a rack server, we usually talk about how many units big it is. Uh, and that's the, the height of it, actually. Uh, I will show you some pictures uh, later on. So what will make this uh, a server? Well, this is the memory, the primary storage. Uh, uh, and that is have features to um, if some parts of the memory go wrong, it can uh, recalculate it and uh, it, it's still okay. It, it has uh, features to make some banks bad but still work. Uh, in some servers you can actually hot swap uh, memory. It's not common because it's quite hard for the operating system to be able to to say that we should stop using this part of the memory during a part and then we swap it and then start using it again. So that's not that common actually uh, that we do. Um, we have multiple CPUs. Uh, that's not so common uh, for a desktop computer. It can have them, but it's not uh, usual. Uh, we have a lot of fans. All these are fans. To transfer all the cool air should come in in the front and go out back. And 
you will see when I, I show you the rack, it's quite tall, and then you have 50 or uh, 48 or 96 servers on a stack. So it has to be the, the, the airflow should go in that direction. This server doesn't have hot swap. You can't uh, put out parts during uh, its uptime. If we go to the, the tower model here, to go around. Uh, here we say this is whoa. Uh, this is a Dell server, uh, and Dell have uh, color coding for parts, uh, which help us. So orange parts can be removed and uh, exchanged during uh, its uptime. So these are fans. Usually, you can just plug them out and get a new one, and it will keep on going during that uh, part. We have blue parts, which can be swapped but not during its uh, uptime. Uh, you also have a RAID controller. That is for disk management. And that's not so usual in, in, uh, in desktop computers either. But I will go through uh, RAID controls later on in this course. Um, not much more to say about that. I won't open the, the desktop computer. Hopefully you have seen the inside of that uh, yourselves. This is a blade uh, server. It's really small. It still has two CPUs uh, and uh, memory and hard disk. But to be able to run this, you have to put it in a blade chassis. Uh, I have a picture on that we can look at, actually. So let's get back to the presentation. Hey. Hmm. Picture's not working. Great. Ah. <laughs> Live coding. Live, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I have forgot to do something. Uh, I will have to show you the, the pictures that I was supposed to show you later on, after a short break, probably. <laughs> uh, I forgot to put them uh, on GitHub, sorry. Uh, so I will get back to uh, how a blade chassis uh, looks. Uh, so we will move forward. Uh, we now have discussed the hardware. We will move up the OSI model uh, and now come to the operating system. And what that is. Well, in the beginning, we usually uh, said that it was software co controlling the hardware. That was an operating system. Modern OS operating system say it's a layer between the, the software and the hardware. So it's not the only thing that's control, controlling the hardware. So we have a, a short question just to see uh, how many of you have actually installed. This will just be 30 seconds or a minute or something like that. So the result is quite easy. You one doesn't have to make a graph of it. It was 38%, uh, 40% that had installed a server operating system. Uh, and 60% uh, have not. So then you will learn something this course. <laughs> uh, so what makes up, before we can, can talk again about a uh, server operating system, we will talk about the basic, the really basic co uh, components of an operating system. We have complete courses on uh, operating system uh, theory and technology, but I won't go at all into depth uh, in this area. I don't think it's, uh, you don't have to know that much actually about it. But some parts I think everyone should know. Uh, so this is the, also if you s search the web or look in a book for, for basic components of an operating system, you will get a lot of answers. Uh, this is the, the main part uh, according to me. You have a process manager. Uh, that ha can't answer that, but I can answer you, you in the classroom. Uh, 
uh, how many, no, we skip that, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, in a system, you have a lot of processes running. Uh, it can be an uh, application like Word. Uh, it can be something that runs in the background, uh, like a service of some sort. It can be the thing that makes the time on your computer go the right way. Uh, and this has to be managed, all these processes. Uh, and the process manager is responsible for that. So to build an operating system, you have, must have a process manager of some sort. Uh, then you have the memory management. You have a lot of different type of, of memory actually in a computer. Uh, and you will hear terms like virtual memory if you look on the web for, for these things. You have uh, registers and CPU cache. Random access memory you maybe have heard of, RAM. Uh, that's the part that I showed before the sticks like this big. They have to have uh, power to work. So if you lose power to the computer, the data that was in the memory is gone if you don't have some sort of backup uh, um, battery. And then you have the, 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 the disk storage, the physical disk where it can be stored more permanently. Uh, it goes like this in terms of, of, uh, of speed. So this is the fastest, and then it will go back down. And the, the memory management is uh, responsible for where, where, where do we have memory uh, on these different types, and where are memory stored, and where are the data stored. Uh, so allocation and deallocation of, of memory, it's uh, managed by the memory uh, management. Then you have to have some, well, you don't have to have this part in an operating system, but they usually have some sort of disk, hard disk, where you can store data more permanently. And to be able to do that, you have to have some sort of file system, uh, a system that uh, makes up how to store the data so you can access it uh, fast, uh, or use the space more uh, efficiently. Uh, and we have a lot of different file systems. And we will go through some of them during this course, but not in this part, because this, this is more theoretical. You will uh, format hard disk and, and uh, with a different file system during this course. But these are quite common. The first two are uh, usually used in Linux systems. Uh, the third uh, FAT32 uh, 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 is an old uh, file system that is used quite often actually because of memory sticks. We want to have uh, some sort of uh, file system that can be used on multiple uh, operating systems. And that is the one that usually is uh, in the work there, or FAT16 uh, also. Then we have NTFS, which is used by Windows systems. Uh, and the last part is for uh, OS X, uh, Mac, uh, Apple operating systems. And if you take a disk that has been uh, formatted in ext2 and you put it in a Windows system, you probably won't be able to read the data. So it's very specific to the, the operating system. Um, you can in, uh, may take an NTFS disk and put it into a Linux system, and with some hard uh, software you can m manage to read it, but not directly, usually. Then we have a uh, network. Uh, you have read uh, some about the TCP uh, stack in the previous part of this course, and every operating system needs some way of communicating with the, the TCP stack to be able to use it. So they have to make their own way of doing that. And we come, when we come to security, uh, this is also not uh, something that every OS has, but usually they have these two parts. Access control, which is what users can do in the system and what processes can do on the system. How do we control that? You maybe have heard the term of 
of uh, rings. When you have ring zero is the kernel, and it can do everything with the hardware. And then you have ring one, which can do some, but not all. And then you go out the layers. So they have some sort of, of access control, what can do uh, what with the hardware. And then we usually have some sort of auditing. If uh, a user changes some files, we should somehow be able to know what which user did what and when. Or if we change some parts of the operating system, what, uh, what process did that and when did it do it? And then you need some sort of shell. Something, it can be a graphical uh, shell, so you can use a mouse and, and click on icons and stuff like that. Or it can be a, a CLI, some sort of command line interface where you put in your data. But you need some sort of shell to communicate with the, with the operating system. Mm. My pictures are not working. Um, that will be a big problem for this part. So we will take 10 minute break. Yes, uh, sorry for the technical problems with this lecture. Uh, I will go back now to the images that didn't work uh, when we talked about the hardware. So we talked about the blade. Uh, and this is a, a computer in a blade server. Uh, and you see here we have a, a blade chassis which has, ooh, I don't know, 16 maybe, uh, computers like this. So this is a physical computer, but it can't work without the, the blade chassis. And that's because of the, uh, the chassis. So this is the, the, the front of the chassis, and this is the back. And as you can see in the back, uh, we have, this is the same. This isn't two as it looks like. It's, it's one. And these are power supplies. So we have four of them. Uh, and we can't control which one is going to which server. It will allocate the, the, the resources that uh, power supply have to all of these. So two can break down and we can change them during uh, the server are uh, up and running. But if all of them are very uh, CPU intense, which use a lot of, of power, then the system probably will break because it, it can't produce that amount of power that it, it needs. Uh, and then you have <coughs> some way to, to connect to the servers uh, with, the, uh, with the monitor and a net, uh, keyboard and a mouse. That's just one to all of these. So in the front you can actually see, if you can't see them, maybe we have two buttons. One, when you push them then uh, the, the keyboard and mouse will work with that uh, server. And we also have a joint networking for these. Uh, they have internal networks, but to get to the outside world, they will go through that switch that's built into the chassis. Then we have the, the rack servers. Uh, here you have two pictures of, of those. Uh, so you have these large racks with uh, computers stacked on them. One problem with this is it gets really messy in the back, as you see. This is just the, the networking. It's not connected any. You can connect a monitor, a mouse, and keyboard to every one of these, but we don't have them. Uh, and it gets quite messy in the blade. Uh, it's much more cleaner for the same amount of, of, uh, of computers. But when you manage these, it's the same way. You have some sort of CLI or uh, a web GUI where you can uh, enter and see all the servers in, in the, the, the rack. Uh, so just a comparison. Uh, all these servers we have here, this big part, the tower models, usually call them. I think it's 15 or something like that there. They have the same amount of computers as you have on 
this part. And these are the same amount as you have in the chassis, which is the blade chassis, which is there. And in this case, the, amount, the same amount of, of compute power, uh, actually. That can be different because you can have, this can have very bad hardware, very good hardware, of course. So you see, you save a lot of, of, of space and power consumption when using uh, newer techniques uh, like a, a blade uh, chassis. It is more expensive, of course, to have uh, that. So let's get back to the operating system. We were here, I think. Yes, we have uh, managed to go through all the, the different parts. So when we talk about operating system, they usually have some sort of architecture, or they do have some sort. It's not so, you're not supposed to see the details of these uh, pictures. I will go through the, d the different architectures. We have three different types there. But before we do that, we have to understand something about user mode and kernel mode. These are terms where you might have heard before. Um, and as you can see in the image, the yellow part is user mode, and the kernel part is uh, the red. Uh, you see here. Uh, and what is the difference when then? Well, user mode, you can't access the hardware. When you say user, you don't mean a physical person. It's a, a user of the, the system or, or a process in the system, or it can be different what that is. But it can't uh, get direct access to, to hardware or, or memory. Uh, it can delegate to some sort of API, a system API, something if they need to uh, have uh, data stored in the memory or if they need to access hardware. Then it will use the controlled API to talk to that part of the, uh, of the system. If you have a crash in the user mode, if you write bad code, it probably won't be uh, a disaster for the, the system. Maybe for the application, uh, but not for the, the entire system. Then we have kernel mode. Here you have full access to the underlying hardware. Um, you can directly access the CPU and give them instructions and address memory directly. So a program here can or well could access memory parts of other programs, which is probably not so great. If you have a crash here, the system will probably halt, so it will stop working. Um, so, no, that's not it. Here we go. <clears throat> this is the first one, the monolithic kernel. Uh, here we have almost the entire operating system in the kernel mode. So, uh, it's uh, divided into multiple parts, but everything here has direct access to the hardware. Uh, it's really fast, as you can understand, because it doesn't have to go through an API to make changes in the memory or uh, get data processed. But it has its drawbacks, as you can understand uh, also. Then we have the, the opposite of that, the, 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 the microkernel, uh, which only has the bare minimum that it needs in the kernel. And then it supplies or has features to make uh, these calls to, to the hardware uh, via some sort of, of system API. Uh, and we have something called the hybrid kernel, uh, which in theory uh, would be the best of the, the two parts. Uh, we can have uh, security by uh, not allowing everything uh, access to kernel mode. Uh, but the speed of, uh, of directly accessing hardware in, in the kernel mode. So you're probably wondering which operating system is using what type of, of uh, architecture. Uh, well, the monolithic, uh, usually uh, we talk about Linux systems. Uh, you can actually run a Linux kernel uh, in a microkernel. Uh, but the, the, the most of them are running a monolithic kernel. Uh, and here we have, ooh, 
if I'm not mistaken, I think some uh, BSD, BSD operating system is running here. Uh, and this is Microsoft's approach. So this is mainly uh, Windows uh, system using this. Oh, sorry. The microkernel, uh, I think Symbian OS, uh, small systems uh, like running on phones, Symbian is one, Blackberry I think is running uh, a microkernel also. Uh, so, got a question there. Is that is that why Linux is so popular for servers? I think it's so popular for servers because it's free. <laughs> Actually, uh, you have to if you, if you Google uh, it, uh, you will find a lot of different why. Uh, Linus Torvaldson choose to make a monolithic kernel. I think it's a big discussion uh, on the internet why he chose that that approach. Um, so I won't go into that. But, but I think what, why Linux is popular in, Linux, uh, in, in servers, it's I think it, it's free. That's the big uh, part of it. So we have one question. I will ask you. I can understand this is quite hard question. But with uh, your knowledge uh, before and what I've been talking about, maybe you can answer this one. So what's the biggest drawbacks with a monolithic kernel? I have, I think, two minutes for this. Oh, maybe one. <laughs> two. It's up. Okay. So uh, I think it was 50% who uh, thought the first one, the kernel increases in size. Well, yes, it does. Uh, you have almost the entire operating system in the kernel, so of course it will increase in size. Uh, uh, then user code can easily be executed in the kernel. No. <laughs> the operating system is running uh, in, uh, in the kernel mode. But if I go back, you see <coughs> there's a difference. Uh, between where the operating system runs and where the system or the, the application that has been written by uh, third parties. That's not part of the, the operating system. Uh, it has to run in user mode here. So it can't uh, access the, the, the kernel mode directly. It has to talk to some sort of system calls or something to the other uh, systems that is running uh, in the, the, the operating system. Uh, so maybe I was unclear there, because I think we had 85% or something like that. I think that was right. Uh, it's slow. No. No, no one uh, answered that one, so that's good. Uh, the lack of extensibility. No one thought that. Well, if you have a kernel who has the entire operating system in it, if you want to change some little part of that, you have to have a new kernel. So actually, they have made this so it, it worked. But if you had a new hardware, you have a, a new uh, uh, network card, which driver is not uh, built in the kernel, then you can't use it until they update the, the, the operating system. They have uh, fix that uh, in Linux system by having uh, modules that can be loaded uh, so you can use drivers. But it's not that, it's hard to extend. Uh, you don't think that when you think about Linux system because they open source and you can, but you have to rebuild the kernel if you want to make sure any changes there. Uh, and th that's the, the last part, uh, the bad uh, maintainability. It's hard to maintain because it's quite big. Um, so uh, the, the, the correct <laughs> answers then were uh, A, C, and D. No, nay, A, D, and E, sorry. Uh, so what makes an, an operating system into a server? Well, <coughs> that's not so easy to uh, to answer actually nowadays. When you run m most Linux system, uh, you install, install the same thing if you're running the desktop version or the server version. Uh, the difference is there when 
you <coughs> will be asked some questions what you will want to do with this machine. If you put that you want a file server uh, or a, a DNS server, then it will uh, configure the operating system to work better for those systems that you wanted to install or these services. Uh, but in Windows, we have a different thing. Then you, there you have two different ports. We have a desktop version of Windows and you have a server version. Um, but these are the main thing. <coughs> Some versions can have limitations by licensing. Uh, you can't have in, uh, in a desktop version, maybe you can't have two CPUs. You must buy an extra li license for that or have to run a server version. You can't access more memory than a limited uh, part. You can't have more than a couple of NICs, maybe. NICs is network uh, cards. Um, this can be limitations. Uh, another part is built-in services. An operating system, which is classed as a server, usually have some services that are built into the system uh, where you can use. Some basic services like DNS or DHCP. They can have a web server or a catalog server. And desktop operating system won't have that. And then usually a server, server operating system have better monitoring uh, for the, the operating system than a desktop version has. So the final part, now that we have the hardware, we have an operating system. What will make a an, an software into a an, uh, an server? Uh, before we can go into that, uh, we have to talk about what's the difference between an application and a service. Uh, I've been using these terms before. Uh, service is usually, uh, this is very much generalized, these uh, points I have here. So they can differentiate. But, but for the most part. Uh, they usually run a single task uh, that it can do well. Uh, it's often accessed by other parts of the system. Uh, uh, it targets uh, a part of a larger domain problem. Uh, it can make uh, work as a little thing in, in a bigger uh, problem. Uh, and it's always running in the background. An application, on the other hand, uh, is usually accessed by us humans. We interact with it in some way. Uh, it doesn't have to have a graphical interface, but uh, has some sort of access for us. Uh, and it usually solves the whole problem, like in uh, Windows Word. Then you can have an uh, edit files and, uh, and stuff like that. You have the entire problem uh, fixed there. So. I think the last question of today, what makes a software, uh, what type, <laughs> what software type is a server? Is it an application, a service, or both, or neither? And this is what, when we talk about server that is running inside a, an operating system. Okay, so we had almost 40% that think it's a uh, service and almost 65% think it's both. And I would say that it's both actually, usually. Uh, a server, when you talk about software, is a program that is waiting for a client. It can be uh, another uh, system, it can be a user, it can be a lot of things. Uh, for it to connect, it makes a, a request and the server process something and then gives back uh, that result or some results. And it's usually built up into two components. We have the, the service that is running in the background that's actually doing this, this part that uh, is listening for something to uh, some request and processes and gives better results. But we have to have some way of 
managing the server, some sort of uh, graphical interface. It can be a, a, a graphical interface or a, a CLI uh, to communicate with that server. We have to make changes. Uh, if you have a web server, we want to tell it to, to run this application or monitor uh, this application. Uh, so it's usually divided up in, in two parts, but I, I can understand that uh, you answered service because this is the main part of, uh, of it, because that's the, the real server part. But usually uh, we, uh, we, we say that these two makes up the server. I think we have a question. Yeah, I got a question from Live Coding TV. Is Apache, uh, Apache 2 an application or a service? Uh, Apache, if you install a Apache server, then I would say it's both. Uh, because if you have an application or a service. Uh, well, well, I, I had this discussion with a couple of colleagues. What, what is the difference between a software, uh, an application, and a program? And that's not so hard to answer. Uh, in most cases, it can be the same. But in some contexts, maybe not so. Uh, my, some colleagues thought that an application, uh, software is, we all think the software is the, the, the broader term, the, the, the umbrella over the other two. Uh, but when we come to an application, usually it's, in my opinion, and some of my colleagues, an application is, uh, is bigger uh, than a program. A program is usually just maybe it solves one problem, but an application is, is, is bigger. Uh, so uh, back to the question, uh, if it was an application or a service? Uh, well, I think it's both because you have the, the service, the daemon that is running in the background is uh, getting the requests, and then you have some sort of uh, program to to tell it what to serve, what uh, web pages to serve. So you have, it's both in that, uh, in that question. So, the last slide of today, if I can get it to work. Yes, my very nice handwritten uh, image. <laughs> uh, and this is about a uh, life cycle of a machine and its OS. Uh, so we will start with a brand new server, a hardware. Uh, usually they come pre-installed, but if we want to use it in our environment, we probably want to uh, build our own system. So we will start up with installing an operating system and maybe getting all the drivers there so it works as it's supposed to. Uh, then the machines enter a new state from new to clean. Uh, that server is, uh, that operating system is not that good because you haven't configured anything on it yet. So then we have the process of initialization uh, where we configure it to do what we want it to do. Uh, we usually call that init or initialations. Then it's configured. That's the state that we want it to be in. But then entropy happens. Something made this configuration not uh, to be in the optimal configuration. Something happens. Then we enter a stage that is unknown. Uh, where we can go from there is actually three legs. We can debug the system, try to find out what's wrong, and then we can come back to a configured system. That is what we want to do as quickly as possible. We can realize that we really don't understand what the problem here is. So we think it's faster for us to go back to the clean state and just do a reconfigure. Uh, we can also uh, get to the point where we think this won't work. It's an old system. We won't take the time to, to do the, 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 the debug and we will probably uh, uh, still retire the system in a couple of months, so we do it now rather than later. So then we will enter the, the end state uh, from that point. You can, the, the better way is to, from a configured state, you set up the new server uh, or the new operating system in parallel, 
and when the new system is up and running, then we will retire this machine and this operating system. Another thing that can happen during the configuration is updates. We want to make uh, the system as updated as possible, um, mostly because with updates, it's security fixes and stuff like that. So we want to have an updated system. I said that we want it as updated as possible. That's n not always uh, right because you want, <coughs> sometimes you want others to, <laughs> because with updates, it uh, can happen that they introduce a new bug. Uh, so you, you probably want to test the, the updates on other systems so you see that it works as it's supposed to. Uh, so that's the life cycle of a machine as an its uh, operating system. It can, of, co of course, uh, differentiate uh, a bit. But. Um, so uh, do we have any questions? You might have an old one on Slack. Don't third-party drivers get full kernel access in monolithic? Uh, I think that's the... Um, uh, yeah, yes, usually they do. Uh, the, in, in Linux system, they have this module-based uh, drivers that can be loaded into the kernel even if uh, after it's built. And they will get uh, full access because they run in kernel mode. Yes, is the answer to that one. Mm. Oh, we have a, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's hard when you read in Swedish and then go back. Uh, we had uh, also a link that it's quite good about uh, the classic uh, kernel debate, uh, which you have there on Slack. Uh, I don't have anything more uh, today. Uh, the students who are registered for the course, I think we will uh, do like we did in the first part. We will get together in the Discord room. And there you can, we can have a discussion in Swedish on this topic of today. So we will meet you there in 10 minutes. End of today.